So my name is Eric Coleman. Um, I work for a company in Columbus called Pillar Technology, and Pillar Technology is a little bit obsessive and maybe even a little dogmatic about testing and um, CI and all the kinds of you know validation processes that we do to write good software. Um, so I am currently on a mobile project with Pillar, and we have a cross-platform application that has um, some kind of interesting things going on in that it is a plugin meant to be integrated into other clients' apps. Um, and so we have kind of an interesting build process and the need to, um, to do a lot of validation and to make sure that our code quality is high. Um, so basically we're gonna, we're gonna go through a sort of a high level overview of um, what continuous integration is and why we do it. Um, then we'll go through, you know, again, a kind of high level overview of, of a sample build pipeline, which is um, dangerously close to the one that we use at my client. Um, we'll kind of dive deeper into each of the steps in those pipelines and kind of talk about, you know, the tools that we can use um, and the purpose of each of those phases. And then we'll kind of outline a, like a sample tech stack. Um, and there obviously will be time for questions at the end. You can also feel free to just raise your hand and ask a question. If something comes up, I, I won't be offended by that. So what is CI, okay? Uh, Continuous integration is what CI stands for, um, and what that means is that we continuously merge new code um, into some central repository. So we have to maybe define what exactly integration means, and, and we probably want to test that code too as we're doing this. The reason that we want to do this is um, we want to continuously validate that our code is correct, that our code acts the way that we want it to, that our app has all the features that we require. Um, and we do that with two phases. So we build the code and we test the code. Um, we also want to merge frequently back into that central repository, um, kind of for obvious reasons. So we want our team to have access to the most up-to-date version of the code that is possible. Um, and it's also just easier, right? No one wants to deal with you know, a, um, a 500 file merge every month. Uh, it, it's a lot easier to do that multiple times a day um, and the other reason that we do it is to enable us to continuously deliver our application. So what does that mean? Um, basically the same thing, right? But instead of integrating our code into a central repository, um, we want to deploy our code as often as possible and get those new features into the hands of users as often as we can. Um, so how do we make that happen? We need a thing um, that we put code into one end of and out the other end come apps. That thing is called a build pipeline. So the build pipeline can kind of be thought of in three separate phases. We have a build phase, a test phase, and a deployment phase. Um, so let's go into our overview. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to build our code. And like I said earlier, you know, this is, this is the first step of validating that our code is correct. We want to, if, if we can't get past compilation, then we can't get very far. So this is the first thing that we need to do to know that we have a working application. Um, it also does things like it validates our dependency management. So if there are external libraries or maybe you know, first party libraries that we need to pull into our code base, um, we wanna make sure that all of those various pieces hang together appropriately and that we can produce an executable. Um, and possibly we'll need those artifacts that built code, that executable for running tests against um, in, in the rest of the build pipeline. So part of the first part of getting code, the first part of building our code is actually getting it into the pipeline. Um, so you know, a developer is at his workstation, he finishes some new feature, some new story card. Um, he does any kind of manual validation that he needs to do, whether that's you know, running test scripts, maybe he boots up the application and clicks around a little bit. Um, but once he's done with that, he's going to hand off his code, you know, he's gonna let his little baby fly and spread its wings in the CI pipeline. Um, so that's generally, generally what that's gonna involve is the developer will have merged his code into that central repository and that's gonna trigger our CI system. The next thing that we'll do is we're gonna test our code. Um, so now that we've compiled our code and now that we know that we've at least gotten that far, um, we have obviously further validation to do. We want our code to be well tested, especially when we're talking about CI, because basically the 
the more test coverage you have, the better tested your code is, the more value you get out of the CI process, the more value you can get out of automatic testing. And there are different types of tests to validate different things about our application. So we have unit tests and integration tests and functional tests, all of which test various kind of layers of the application. Once we've built and tested our code, we know it's good, now we need to get that code in the app into the hands of our testers or our users. Um, and you know, it needs to be easy for them to get. They don't wanna have to hook up a phone to a computer, run some weird thing through Android Studio or Xcode to get that app onto their device. It should be easy for the people who are gonna use this to get it onto their devices. And that kind of goes into that last point that we need to be able to run it on a device too, not just in a simulator or the Android emulator. All right, so that's kind of the high level overview of the process of continuous integration and deployment, which, you know, at this stage, this kind of applies to any sort of application we're building, not, not specific to mobile. But we're gonna talk kind of about the pieces that are specific to the process of doing this for mobile. Um, so the process of getting code into the pipeline has a couple different components. We have workstations, the developers are gonna be writing this code on some kind of a computer and we need to figure out how we want that to look, what kind of tools we want, um, you know, the standardization of those environments. Um, there are gonna be processes that are kind of not necessarily fully technical processes, right? These are things that you do in your team room um, like code review or like pair programming or like I mentioned earlier, maybe there's some manual validation steps that you do before you trigger CI. You'll need some kind of source control management server, whether that's something that you host locally or whether that's you know, GitHub, um, you're gonna have to have a place to put this code. And then we need to figure out our dependency management too. So if we're gonna pull in first party or third party libraries, if, if there are things that we need that are not things that we necessarily wrote, we have to figure out a way to get those to where they need to be in order to build. So workstations. Um, on our project, we, we use Macs um, because you know, part of kind of the genius of Apple is basically that if you wanna write an iOS application, you have to use their hardware, which means that if you're writing both kinds, you're probably writing your Android code on a Mac. Um, so we want that development environment to be consistent across all of our workstations. We need you know, a standard tool set, and if you're going to manage more than one workstation, you're probably gonna need some kind of software to help you make sure the configuration is the same across machines. The processes, like I mentioned earlier, these are not necessarily things that computers do, but more, more the things that you've chosen to do in your team room. So, you might have coding standards and maybe you run some kind of linting program against that. Um, you'll have manual processes that you go through in order to validate that the code is correct. You'll have version control processes. You know, maybe you use Git flow, maybe you, know, you do feature branches or some variation of that. Um, and then the other thing is that if you're going to bother to have a continuous integration system, then you need to take the results that come out of it seriously. Now the piece of that that you care about if you're me, the DevOps guy, is that your CI system needs to be stable enough to take it seriously. So as an example, we have a suite of Appium tests, um, which is like a cross-platform functional testing tool, and we've had some kind of trouble with stability over the course of this project. When you get to the point where a red build on the radiator doesn't mean anything to anyone because they're so used to seeing it, then your automated testing has totally failed to have value to you and it's just a waste of time trying to keep those results green. So stability in, is a huge part of being able to take those results seriously. For your source control server, you're gonna, like I said, you'll have to have somewhere to put your central repository. Um, you probably wanna make backups of that. You don't want, you know, some random fire or uh, cosmic ray bit flip to you know, lose you a million dollars worth of code. Um, you need to have your code easy to access so that a developer who you know, needs to pull it down can do that easily, doesn't have to spend a lot of time on that kind of a problem. 
if it's local to your room, if you're keeping that internal, then you're going to need somewhere to run it, whether that's a server or you know a Docker container somewhere. Somewhere you'll have to host this thing. Um, and this is kind of a standard feature, so maybe it's almost not worth mentioning, but it needs to be able to notify your CI system when there are changes. There are a ton of options here. Um, we currently use Stash, which is now called Bitbucket Server. Um, there's GitLab. And you know you don't have to host this in your room. Like I said, you can use GitHub. You can get a private repo, and that has all the kinds of integrations that you would need. And then dependency management. So where do the dependencies live? Um, how do we get them into our application? How do we keep them up to date? You know, are we creating, like for example, with our iOS application, we use CocoaPods. So part of the build pipeline and part of deployment is getting our code packaged into the, you know, the form that CocoaPods can use. Similarly with Android, you know, we're using Maven, so we have to have a Nexus server. Part of our build process is packaging up those artifacts and making them consumable by apps that are down the line. So building involves the CI server and build jobs. Um, so CI server is kind of, it's gonna be necessary for every phase in this pipeline. And what the CI server does is kind of coordinates all these different tasks and functions that have to happen in order for code to go in one end and apps to come out the other. There's a lot of options here too. Um, Jenkins is, is probably the most standard of these. It's been around for a long time. Um, I think it's kind of starting to show its age. So there are things out there like Team City, GoCD, Travis, Bamboo, um, lots of options here with various levels of integration into other services and, and things like that. Um, so, you know, that's the kind of thing, in, in this case, the particular product that you choose doesn't actually matter. It's, it's what you do with it, and so, you know, choosing this is really just up to your team and what they need and what you guys think is best, what's free, what's not free, all those kinds of things are considerations in when you're picking these. Um, but one way or another, probably it's going to be triggered by pushes to that central repo, right? So, you know, maybe when it gets a push, it sends something out to Jenkins, or maybe Jenkins keeps an eye on a particular endpoint and, you know, triggers something when it sees a, ch a change. Um, but one way or another, when, when a developer merges code into the branch of record, your CI system needs to know about that. Um, similarly to your source control server, you're going to need somewhere to run this thing. Um, there are also cloud options for CI, so you know that's, that's always an option too, but if you're going to have it in your room, you'll have to have a server, a Docker container, a VM, whatever you do. Um, and then kind of the other piece of the CI system is that a CI system will have executors, or at least in the case of Jenkins it does. So as I mentioned earlier, the CI system kind of coordinates all these different tasks and then sends, you know, basically you say, okay, run this section of this that builds the code. It'll send it out to somewhere where that gets executed and that thing does the actual legwork of building the code and then reports back to Jenkins or whatever um, with the results. Executors should be configured identically to workstations. So what that means is you, you never want to be in a situation where a developer is coming up and tapping you on the shoulder and says, hey man, this code builds on my workstation, but Jenkins is telling me that it's red. You, you know, you, you're always going to have that to some degree, but you can minimize it by making sure that the configuration on those machines is identical to the workstations. Um, and this configuration on your CI system, it counts as code, so you want to put this under version control. You don't want to lose a day's worth of work or 10 days worth of work or two years worth of work because you don't back up your code. To that point, do you know if there's a, an easy way to mirror the um, error SDK locally? So if you have eight different places that you can end up, you don't have to download it separately for all those? Because that's one of the places where we probably would save some work in our IT group. Yeah, so um, the way that we handle that and it's not perfect, but the way that we handle it is we basically created a gold version of our Android SDK with all the dependencies and everything that we need downloaded. And then we host that on a, a machine. Um, it's actually the machine that runs Jenkins. So there are scripts, um, which I'll get into later, that you can run on your machine to update 
your SDK from that gold one. And so that obviously brings in its own set of problems, right? Like you need to keep that central thing updated because if someone goes and updates from the gold and then all of a sudden they can't build, they're gonna be mad at you. Um, so, you know, there are a whole suite of problems that go along with that and obviously it's not perfect, but that, that's how we handle that. And you still do have to download it, but at least you're on your local network and you can kind of use rsync to not have to spend so much time. So build jobs. Um, if, if any of you are familiar with Jenkins, you, you might know that you know, when you have a job on Jenkins, um, basically you'll have kind of some configuration like, hey, where's the Git repo I'm watching? When do I, how often do I trigger this, whatever. And then you'll usually have like a section that you know, you can put some bash code in, or maybe some groovy code into um, that runs your build process or your test process or whatever. You want to keep that code that's embedded in a Jenkins job to the absolute minimum. Um, so the way that you accomplish that is that your projects that you have, they need to know how to build and test and deploy themselves. And what I mean by that is they, you should only need the code that's in that repo in order to do all those things. So the way that we have this set up, we have a directory in each of our projects called CI. In that directory are a set of scripts like CI slash build dot shell, CI slash unit test dot shell. So that the code that winds up in your Jenkins job just becomes, hey, go call that script. And in doing that, you can keep the knowledge of how I build or deploy or test uh, local to the project that cares about it and you know avoid having to like let's say so for example one nice feature of doing things this way is that the developers use those same scripts while they're writing code to run the tests to build to do those things against their code so Jenkins is going to behave in roughly exactly the same way that a developer is going to test his code or build his code um, you know again further eliminate as much of that it works on my machine type of thing as possible. The CI system, like I mentioned earlier, is really just a coordinator. So you really just want to use this thing as minimally as possible to kind of wire up the jobs and say, okay, go run this script, then go to the next job that runs this script. And, you, and even so, that still counts as code, that configuration, so you've got to VC it. So testing. Um, there are kind of four components of this, or at least that's how I have broken down. The first of those is testing practices. So this is kind of, again, that sort of team room thing, not necessarily fully technical. This is, you know, what has your team decided that, how are we gonna handle this? How are we going to, what are our standards around what it means to be able to go merge and to develop? Um, as I said earlier, the more test coverage you have, the more value you can get out of your CI system. If you've got one unit test and it tests at 2 plus 2 equals 4, you're wasting your time with Jenkins because it's not going to tell you anything of value except maybe that your code builds. Um, so, you know, the more you have, it's definitely a linear relationship with how good your validation from CI is. You want to automate as much as humanely possible. You don't want, you know, anything that you can teach a computer to do, you don't want a human to have to do it. So, if you've got a team of QA guys who are going and clicking through that same process, is there a way that you can automate that? Um, and, you know, hopefully you don't put them out of a job, but, but a computer can do that quicker and easier and more efficient and with less errors. So that's, that's the way to go. Automate as much as you can. You should consider test driving your mobile code. So um, this is not an easy thing to do at all times. Um, and, and we can kind of talk about some of the caveats of this and kind of the places that on our project we've had to give a little bit on, on test driving every single line of code with a unit test. Um, but there are good tools out there for writing tests against mobile code, so you, know, you should consider at least giving it a shot. Um, and similar to your CI results, you want to take your test results seriously. If, if your tests go red and that's not setting off red flags for people, then that's a problem. You can also you know, implement different types of tests. So there's unit and integration and functional and you know, probably um, if you pick a developer in this room, they'd have different words for all of those different types of testing. Uh, but you, know, you wanna test in as many layers as you can. 
So unit testing is kind of, you know, if you're doing TDD, you're going to write your unit tests as you write your code. Um, you know, you've probably all heard the red-green refactor cycle where you write a failing unit test, you write the line of code or 10 lines of code that make that test pass, you watch it go green, and then you move on to the next piece. Um, unit tests test a single component or, you know, even a function or method um, in isolation. So they're going to cover kind of like internal logic to classes and methods and things like that. Um, if we're talking about Android, you're probably writing your unit tests in JUnit. Um, if you're talking about iOS, you know, you're probably looking at Quick or OC Unit. There's other tools out there. Um, we have found that the iOS unit testing is tougher than the Android unit testing. Um, and we'll kind of, I'll talk in a minute here about what we've done to kind of get around our inability to unit test everything. Um, and also, you know, you need to get test reports out. So the results of your tests need to be in an easily readable format. A developer needs to be able to look at, you know, one page of text and say, okay, I know what's wrong, I know what failed. If you're familiar with working in something like IntelliJ or even Xcode, you know, you can set up your tests to run as part of your IDE. So, you know, you know visually and easily which ones failed and which ones went green. Then there's integration testing. So integration testing kind of tests different interactions between different components in your application. Um, and these have more dependencies and so they're more expensive to write, right? If I need to test, you know, my main activity or something, I might need to spin up uh, real or mock versions of 10 or 15 or 20 classes to make that happen. Um, so these ones, you know, you're typically not going to test drive with an integration test just because it's a higher expense. But these kind of validate the, the hanging together of the different pieces of your app. Um, for Android, you might use something like Dagger to do dependency injection and kind of save you from having to write all this boilerplate to spin up the various classes that you need to test a piece of functionality. Um, also, you know, they're probably going to require the emulator, or in Android, there's RoboElectric, which kind of lets you simulate the emulator. Um, these are probably also written in JUnit or Nimble if you're in iOS. They can also test, you know, your third-party code integrations. Maybe you're testing your external services. Um, and so, kind of next up is functional testing. And functional testing basically simulates exercises the code through the UI. So it's kind of simulating the way that a user is going to interact with your application. Like I said earlier, you know, you can use this to automate a lot of the kind of manual testing that QA people have to do. Um, you can also use this to do things that maybe humans don't do, like monkey testing, where you just kind of send a bunch of random inputs and see what happens. You know, hey, uh, this, this set of random inputs broke the app. What happened? Things like that, you know. So, I guess you could probably get a human to do that too at some point, you know. You can let a computer do that. Um, there is functional testing built into the Android testing library. There are also options like Robotium, UI Automator, Calabash, Appium. Um, I, on the iOS side of things, we use Kith in addition to Appium. Google has a thing called Earl Grey, which looks kind of nice. Um, and then these, you know, these tests also can run on a device or you can run them on a simulator and emulator. If you really want to be thorough, maybe you're doing both. Um, and so we use functional testing, as I've been kind of alluding to, to get around the fact that we can't unit test every line of code. Unit testing UI is tricky and, you know, kind of a pain in the ass. So in a lot of cases, we say, okay, you know, we're probably not going to unit test this. Let's, let's write a functional test that simulates what we're trying to do and then write the code to make that pass. And, you know, in that way, we kind of get past, like I said, Pillar's, pillars uh, obsession with TDD. So one other point to maybe make is, is I called out Appium. Appium uh, claims to be a cross-platform testing library, and it is that. But the amount of code that you have to write to make that the truth is, is not trivial. So, you know, there's been plenty of back and forth on my team about, hey, would it have been better to not go with Appium and to write, you know, our functional tests for both sides of the application? Um, you know, as I keep saying, that's kind of a decision that your team has to make. 
you have to decide what kind of value you're going to get out of you know, being able to write a test once. And you have to also consider that it's actually not just writing a test once, it's writing you know, kind of uh, shim code to make those tests work against two different versions of an app. All right, so deployment. Um, devices and your deployment system are kind of the components here. So if you have manual testers, which we do, they're going to need devices. And probably your developers are going to need devices too. Um, like I said earlier, you know, if you have functional tests or kind of automated tests, you can use that to run tests on device, which kind of shows you a even better picture than the emulator of you know what how, how this thing works on your device. Um, the Android emulator has command tools that will let you run tests on device and also just kind of communicate with device, find things out like how many Android devices are plugged into this machine and things like that. Um, the iOS simulator, you know, can stand in place of a device, but Xcode also has tools um, to communicate with iOS devices that are attached to a computer. And if you're unlucky like me, you're going to get stuck keeping track of these devices too. So these small, expensive computers do have a habit of walking out of rooms if they're not kept track of. Um, so someone is going to have to make sure that that doesn't happen. I have become the phone librarian at, at my office. And it, it's not fun, but someone does have to do that. So we have kind of an inventory system and a checkout system for the various devices. Um, and, it's, and it's worked pretty well. We did actually lose a couple devices before we did that, and we haven't lost any since. So that, that seems to have worked to me. If you have all this stuff, then you know, you're at kind of the last piece of this, which is your deployment system. You're going to have to get your code into an APK or an IPA, you know, depending on which platform you're on. Um, you may have already done that as part of the initial steps of the build pipeline. You're going to have to deploy it to somewhere that people can get it on their devices. You know, maybe you use something like Hockey. Um, there's lots of solutions that are similar to Hockey out there where you kind of have an internal app store where people can go and download the most recent version to their device. Um, before we had Hockey, we stuck a link to the file on someone's machine up on our Confluence page. So, you know, it doesn't have to be hockey. It doesn't have to be this big uh, clunky thing. It can be just as simple as a link. But one way or another, the people who need to test this app have to be able to get it onto their phones. Um, then, you know, if, you, if you're lucky, maybe deployment means getting an app out to the App Store. So for us, Deployment to me kind of means, okay, my QA people can get the app, and from there, my team doesn't really have control of what happens. So we don't get to you know, push to production every two weeks or anything exciting like that. Um, but what we do is, you know, what I consider deployment for the purposes of our project is getting that app into the hands of testers. Um, you know, if, you are, if you are an agile fundamentalist, this might kind of rankle a little bit that, hey, you, you can't deploy to real users every time, but um, if you have worked in consulting or for you know big, ugly corporations, it's just the way it is. So you have to kind of decide, you know, when do I no longer have influence over this code? Um, but if you are lucky, you can use something like Fastlane to automate even you know, deploying all the way out to an app store. Um, so we've kind of just recently begun experimenting with Fastlane which is kind of just a whole suite of tools to make building, testing, deploying mobile applications easier. All right, so let's talk a little bit about my tech stack. So we have iMacs, as I said earlier, kind of, you know, Apple has, has got you, um, has got a good hold on you. If you need to write iOS code, you're going to be doing it on Macs, and so your Android code's probably going to be written there too. We use a tool called Boxin to automate the configuration of those machines. So Boxin is a tool um, developed by the people who did Homebrew, and it uses Puppet, which is kind of like a big enterprise scale config management tool. Um, it, it's pretty nice. It has a lot of power. And frankly, we don't use a ton of that power. We use Boxin to do basically all of our configuration um, in, in a lot of ways, it just wraps brew, right? So I have a list of packages that I need from brew. Boxin can handle that. It can do things like brew cask. You know, if you have GUI applications or your Android studio or whatever, it can manage that. Um, we use it to do things like copy our bash profile into place or 
to script the downloading of the gold Android SDK. Um, so, you know, it, it's kind of a jack of all trades. We use it for a lot of different things. And it's pretty good. Um, any config management tool is going to have downsides and upsides. The downsides of Boxin are, are that, you know, it wraps Puppet in a way that is not always transparent. So sometimes you get errors or things don't work and it's, and it can be really hard to debug. Um, another downside of Boxin is that once a machine has been Boxinized, it takes about two minutes to update that. But the first time, um, at least with our setup, it takes around four hours. So if you need to do something like, hey, this machine is just totally screwed, I'm going to nuke it and I'm going to redo this, then that is, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a cost of me having to sit there in front of it for that amount of time, but there is a productivity cost in having one of your machines out of commission for that long. And those are all the kinds of things that you're going to have to think about if you're choosing to use some kind of config management system. Um, we use Git for source control, which seems to be almost 90% of the standard these days. Um, there's obviously other tools out there. We like Git. Uh, we use Stash and Bitbucket as our central code repository. And we trigger our CI builds with webhooks. So um, what that means is that there is a little integration in Stash where you can say, hey, when a new commit comes into this branch, send a link to Jenkins and tell it, hey, go build this commit. Um, you can do this the other way too. And we've kind of gone back and forth because we've had trouble with getting the webhooks to be reliable. So there have been times where we say, okay, how about this? How about Jenkins just watches this page and whenever it changes, we, you know, we run the build. So that's kind of one of those things that you'll have to decide and see how well either option works for you. As I mentioned many times, we use Jenkins as our CI coordinator. Um, we run our builds on Mac minis and Mac pros, which are kept in a closet. So the Mac minis, um, all these machines are configured identically, but we do kind of use, Jenkins has a system of tags that you can apply to individual executors. And so we use that to say, hey, like run these, run these intensive uh, Appium tests on the Mac pros to try to shave off some time. And you know, if it's just something simple, don't go waste a Mac pros time with that running on a Mac Mini. Um, so that, you know, again, what you use to execute your builds is kind of going to depend on what you're doing. If you're just on Android, you, you don't have to be locked into Mac. If you're doing both, you do. We use Nexus to host our Android artifacts. So Nexus is a Maven repository. Um, we deliver to Maven as part of our deployment process, and then the app can pull that down and build the most recent version. And similarly, on the iOS side, we use CocoaPods. Running that locally has a whole host of you know, challenges. Um, at the least, it requires kind of a local Git repository to run that. Because of the nature of what we're doing, that stuff can't be out in the main CocoaPods repo. It has to be private. So you know, I, I would guess that most of you are in the same situation, and you're not you know, lucky enough to be doing like uh, open source work that is altruistic. So for testing, we use JUnit and we use RoboElectric and Dagger um, for dependency injection and for kind of not having to spin up the whole Android emulator. Um, we used to use JennyMotion because prior to about, let's say six months ago, um, the Android emulator that shipped with the Android SDK was so dog slow that you could hardly use it to do anything. Um, so we paid for JennyMotion. In recent months, the Android emulator has gotten pretty good and they've kind of gotten past a lot of that slowness. So we have switched away from JennyMotion. Um, there are costs to that though. We switched away because the company didn't want to pay for more licenses, but JennyMotion has some better command line tools for doing things like spinning up an emulator or you know, um, downloading an app to an emulator. So like I keep saying, that's just something that your team is going to have to choose based on you know, what you need. Um, but the Android emulator is free, and that's a pretty big deal. We use Appium with Cucumber for functional testing. So as I mentioned before, Appium purports to be a cross-platform functional testing tool. 
um, but that is not an easy thing to make happen. Um, our actual Appium, a lot of our Appium code was written by another vendor who came in and did a bad job. Um, so we kind of have to deal with, you know, this convoluted code base. And if you're writing an Appium test, you're kind of having to peer through lots of stuff to figure out, you know, you know how the tests work and how they access different elements of a page in the app and stuff like that. Um, I'm sure that that kind of, so, so the code that I'm talking about, what it does is basically bridges the gap between Android and iOS and you know, you, you have a, a test written in Cucumber with like a given when then syntax and then the code kind of says, okay, well on iOS, you know, the submit button has this key and on Android it's this key and things like that. So it's basically bridging the gap between the two platforms. Um, but like I keep saying, that is not a trivial process and, you know, your team is going to have to decide whether they want to go that route or if they want to, um, you know, kind of individually implement functional tests. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, we use Hockey um, as kind of an internal app store to deploy this stuff out to. Um, so that's actually, that's all I have. Um, this is stuff about me, um, and if anyone has questions, we've got about 10 minutes. So um, when I said that we've recently started to experiment with that, uh, Friday we started to experiment with that. <laughs> so um, Fastlane has a lot of really nice things about it. One reason that we began to look at Fastlane is because code signing for iOS is an absolute nightmare. And Fastlane has tools and you know a sort of pattern that you're supposed to be able to follow to make it less horrible. Um, I have spent the last two or three weeks dealing with a code signing issue that keeps coming back in various forms. I feel like I push the code signing boulder up the hill and teeters on the tip and it looks like it's going to balance and then you know two weeks go by and something breaks. Um, I don't know what that says about me as a DevOps guy. <laughs> but um, yeah, it is code signing on iOS is just no fun. And so that is kind of the thing that prompted us to look at Fastlane. They have a tool called Psy, which is very appropriately named that is supposed to deal with provisioning profiles. And then there's a cert tool that um, deals with those, those uh, development certs. So we have gotten as far as um, implementing our build in that thing. We have not gotten to the point where we use it to do code signing yet. Um, so I'll, you know, you'll have to ask me later <laughs> to see if that turned out to be good. Also, um, I, I didn't get to mention Docker. Um, I, I, th I think that's kind of an interesting piece of what we do. So we run Jenkins um, out of Docker. We run Stash in a Docker container, and we run our Nexus in a Docker container. So Docker for Mac is kind of an interesting thing. Prior to a couple months ago, to run Docker on a Mac, you ran this tool called Docker Machine, which basically was like a really tiny Linux VM um, because Docker didn't work natively on Mac. And so you use this little tiny Linux VM to run your little tiny VMs um, with Docker. We recently switched over to Docker for Mac because that's out. The problem is Docker for Mac has an NFS issue that makes disk speeds about 50 times slower. Um, so we actually had to pull Jenkins out of Docker because it just got to the point where it was unusable. Um, so I, I like Docker for a lot of reasons. It does a lot of cool things, but for us, we've kind of started to move away from it because the overhead of dealing with that kind of disk space or disk, you know, access issue um, just became impossible. And you know, we have basically switched the things that still use Docker back to that old Docker machine way of doing things. Um, so right now, Docker on Macs, you know, in my opinion, is very suboptimal. Um, now we did get a lot of cool features out of it, so we we would have like a data directory that you know consists of whatever configuration that that service needs. So like all the Jenkins data lives in a directory on the host. 
And the nice thing about that is you can just spin up a Docker container on top of that data. So if your Jenkins starts to act weird, you can say, okay, we'll throw that one out and just put a new one over top of the old data and see if that fixes anything. And that has helped like a lot of various problems. So in a lot of ways, it's a bummer to lose Docker, but I think, you know, like I said, for us, the, the, the calculus of the whole thing just became that, you know, it's costing us too much to maintain Docker when you can just run Jenkins raw on a, on a given server. So if I had my way, we would automate all the tests and we wouldn't have to do manual testing at all. I don't think that's, it, I don't think it's ever going to be quite that good, but I think that, you know, manual testing is a drag. If a developer has to do it, it's a huge drag, especially if you're, you know, if you're hiring consultants and you're talking like hundred dollar bill rates, you don't want to pay that guy to sit there and tap on an app when he could be writing code and adding value. You know, if you hire QA people, then that's a little different, but it's the same thing. You know, those guys can be doing more important things than, than clicking through an app. I think that, like, there's a certain degree of manual testing that's necessary just to have a human's eyes on what you're doing and, you know, to make sure that everything looks good to an actual guy or girl, not a computer. Um, but to me, like, the vast majority of the stuff that we have to repeat every time we release a new version is a waste of time because it could be automated. Now, like I said earlier, we're kind of in a situation with Appium where writing those manual tests can be pretty cost, or writing those functional tests can be pretty costly. So that kind of goes into the whole calculation of, you know, whether that's worth it or not, or whether you just pay a guy to do it. And the company that I'm at um, kind of already has a, a manual QA wing, and they have people that can do that. They're, they're totally comfortable bringing in QAs from, you know, external vendors. So it really just depends on your environment. But you know, to me, in a perfect world, you would do as, as little manual testing as absolutely possible. Yep, that, that's a very important and that's point too. Yeah, and we do some of that too. So we run probably the majority of our Appium tests, we run like on the emulator and the simulator just because that's easier for CI to coordinate. Um, but we do have, you know, uh, Android and iOS devices hooked up to one of the build machines. And we have, you know, spent some time to write scripts around, okay, show me what I've got connected and pick one to run these on and, and stuff like that. So, and, and, and Mike brings up a good point too, which is that you don't necessarily have to have an in-house device farm. There are, there are services like the Amazon thing you mentioned, and um, I think Appium actually has a, a similar thing. So you, know, you, can, you can choose to pay for access to someone else's device farm and you know, run, your, run your tests against a whole big suite of devices. And you know, in the case that you're a small to medium company and you're like, man, I really don't want to spend 10 grand on different phones, you know, maybe that makes sense. 
like I keep saying, <laughs> that's just one of those things that your team is going to have to decide and figure out, you know, what are my priorities? What am I trying to get? What can I spend? All that, all that stuff and go from there. Anyone else? All right, well, thanks for coming, guys.